Um, we're lucky tonight. We have uh, a, a number of um, pieces of entertainment for us. As part of the school board, we, we discuss a lot of business, and it's only fitting that once in a while we have some students come in and show us some of the things that they're doing in the school district. So I know uh, Mr. Shutter has... Mr. Shutter, you brought some people to uh, give some presentations tonight. Do you want to... Okay. Do you want to tell us who's here and what we'll be seeing? Uh, yes. I have uh, students tonight that are here from different grade levels. First of all, I have Mr. Shutter, yes, I'm sorry, why would you please... Yes. Yeah. All right, I wasn't sure. Yes. Sorry about that. I've done this before, I should know better. Yes, you should. Know better. 30 years. Um, I have uh, invited students from different grade levels here tonight. First of all, uh, we have fourth graders who represented um, the Toma School District in our regional heritage fair, which was held a couple weeks ago at St. Matthew's Church, which is located in Warrens. We had a representative from each fourth grade class, and I asked two of them to come tonight and share their projects. Um, this is a required activity for all the fourth graders in the um, community that attend public schools. Uh, Mr. McMullen was uh, nice enough to be the judge at Miller School and he thought it would be a good idea if, if you were able to see some of the work that the uh, students have done. And I have a young man that's from Miller School, uh, Colin Dawson, and then somebody from uh, Warren's, uh, Thor Lass. And I'm going to let each of them come up. Uh, we'll start with Colin, and he can share his project to you just as if you were sharing it in front of uh, the committee like he did for the Heritage Fair project. Um, when they're doing the Heritage Fair project, it has to have some relevance to Wisconsin. It can be about a place you can go visit, it can be about an industry, a famous person, uh, something that's local, it can be about their own specific family heritage. So um, Colin's mom's going to carry his project and hold on to it while he shares with you. So, so if you want to, you can speak right into the microphone, and I know you have no trouble speaking, so this should be very easy for you. Do you want to just put that okay. like that? Is that okay if he does that? Yeah. I want to step out of the My name is Colin Dowson, and this is my heritage. And my Heritage Fair project is called Timber and Wisconsin Lumber Industry. Lumber industry began in Wisconsin in the early 1800s. And the most valuable wood harvested in our state is white pine. Lumber was the top industry in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin the top state in providing it to the country. Today I'm going to be talking about Monroe, Juneau, and Jackson counties. Within these counties was an area called the B Big Swamp, so-called because it is a very marshy area. Within the Big Swamp were islands covered in white pine. The Big Swamp Dilemma, how to get to them. The answer is something unique to our state. Lumberjacks hand dug canals three to four feet wide, six to eight feet deep, and when they were added all together, 20 miles long. My great grandpa knew some of this information because he used to dig ditches for cranberry marshes and knew where some of the canals were. He uh, gave information to a man called Ralph S. Wine, who was the author of a book, Dilemma in the Big Swamp. Three famous lumberjack camps in our area were Goodyear, McKenna, and Zeta. Also, one of the very first portable mills was at Mather Station in Juneau County, Wisconsin. Before lumberjacks arrived in an area, men called timber wolves inspected areas for the best land and trees. This man within the trees is my timber wolf. It's kind of hard to see him. Um. Timber wolves would inspect areas for the best land and trees, and then they would race other timber wolves to a government land office where um, they could claim land and trees for their company. Life at a lumberjack camp isn't easy. This is my lumberjack shanty. A shanty was a long, low building that housed up to 200 lumberjacks. Lumberjacks needed five meals a day and 8,000 calories, which is a lot more than a regular person. <laughs> Their cook would wake them up at 4.30 a.m. with a 
call something like this. There's daylight breaking in the swamp. Roll out or fall out, just get out. Today's the day to make a fortune. <laughs> I'll also be talking about lumberjacks, their lives, and their jobs. The man who oversaw things at a lumberjack camp was called a push boss. He was in charge at every lumberjack at a lumberjack camp. The first lumberjacks to work with a tree were called fitters. They determined which way the tree would fall and then cut a notch into that side of the tree. These men are my fitters. Um, after that, men called fellers would cut the tree down with a crosscut saw. Crosscut saw was a large saw, an example of how long is six feet. One lumberjack would stand on one side of the tree and hold one end of the saw, and the other lumberjack would stand on the other side of the tree and hold the other end of the saw. And they would push and pull back and forth until the tree was cut down. After the tree was cut down, men called swampers cut off all the tree's limbs. These men here are my swampers. Then men called buckers would cut each tree into smaller logs but they were still really big. Men called skitters would then tie each log to a sleigh. And the sleigh was driven by men called teamsters. Ah, oh, forgot to mention. Skitters took the logs to a loading yard and at the loading yard a man called a skybird would then guide the logs onto the sleigh. A man called a hay man on the hill would follow the sleigh's progress, and if the sleigh started to go too fast, he would throw hay in front of its runners. This was so it would not kill the horses pulling the sleigh. Once the sleigh arrived at a river, a man called a scaler measured each log to see how much lumber it would provide. Then a man called a marker marked it on each end with a symbol unique to his company so it would not get confused with other logs at a sawmill. In, during winter, when lumberjacks worked, logs piled up on a river bank. And then in spring, the logs would be put into the river. Men called river rats would guide the logs down the river. Sometimes there were log jams and river rats had to use dynamite to get them loose. This guy here is my river rat taking care of a log jam. Logs were first transported by river and later by railway. This is good because wood shrinks over time and becomes less valuable. So they got the lumber to sawmills and then where they needed to be a lot faster. Also it was less dangerous and took less men. So companies spent less money and got more and quicker. Modern logging is much different. Today you need a certificate to become a modern lumberjack. Also, the method of cutting down logs is different. In the 1800s, lumberjacks would completely change the landscape by clear-cutting trees. This means they would cut down every single tree, even small ones. That's not what happens today. Today, modern loggers only cut down a few trees in an area. This is good, because without trees, we wouldn't be able to breathe, and many animals wouldn't have homes. I got my information from books, the internet, newspaper articles, and my great grandma. This has been my Heritage Fair project on lumber industry in Wisconsin. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Colin. It's too bad he's so shy. He has a real hard time getting up and running. <laughs> Um, then the last uh, project is Thor Lasses. You know, I'm looking around here at this group, and many of you I know have actively been involved with this, whether it's through parents or grandchildren or, or your own children. I remember your daughter shared something that Al Jarreau, who was a famous like jazz singer or something, was from Milwaukee. You remember that? Yes, I do. And so it's like every year when I do this, I learn new and interesting things. But I, that just came to my memory. And I know a lot of other people here have had kids that they've helped along, too. So I know it's kind of been a family project. So thank you. Maybe belated, but still. Thor, are you ready? Hi. 
Hi, my name is Thorlass. I am from Warrens Elementary, and I will be talking about Wisconsin State Fish Hatcheries, specifically Wild Rose. The reason I chose this topic is because I like to fish. Hat there, are, there are hatcheries in Wisconsin are important to us. Are run, here are some facts about hatcheries in Wisconsin run by the state. There are 17 hatcheries, egg collection facilities, and rearing stations in all. A hatchery is a place where they raise and hatch fish. And um, rearing stations just raise the fish and, and egg collection facilities, hatch fish eggs, then transfer them. Here is a map of the Wisconsin fish hatcheries. The green is the egg collection facilities, the blue is the hatching and rearing stations, the black is the brood stock hatching and rearing stations, the red and the red is the rearing stations. This is Wild Road and this is Warrens. Here are some facts about Wild Rose. It is the largest cold, cold water hatchery in Wisconsin. It has it, it it is one of only three to raise cold and cool water fish. Cold water fish need sixty to forty to sixty degree water, and they include round trout, chinook, and coho salmon, walleye, and suckers. Cool, cool water fish need sixty to seventy degree water, and they include musky. Lake Sturgeon and Northern Pike. It's the only hatchery to raise spotted muskie and lake sturgeon. Here is what I learned on my visit to Wild Rose. It is built in 1909 and raised carp to feed the needy. After that, it, it, it raised carp to, I mean, it gave people jobs during the Great Depression. Then it raised trout and salmon to control the alewives in the Great Lakes. And it rebuilt, they re added the cool water hatchery and rebuilt it in two phases and completed it in 2009. There's some pictures. <laughs> it, it, here's what I saw at the old hatchery. I saw ponds and raceways. A pond is a circular cement pool and a raceway is a rectangular cement pool. And um, it's fed by an artesian spring that keeps the water 45 degrees and um, we got to feed the fish there. This is one of the biggest fish they had. There are some pictures of the feeding frenzy. At the education center they had there, there were aquariums, games, and learning activities, a video of how they run the hatchery, and the mouse. This is a picture of me and my family standing under a lake surgeon now. At the new hatchery, there were egg. Egg incubators, this is a model of one, swim with fry and start tanks, and the new raceways. Here are some fun facts about Wild Rose. It raise up, raises up to 50 tons of fish every year for more than 100 years. And it contributes to statewide stocking of fish with 27% of trout and salmon, 64% of northern pike, and 100% of lake sturgeon and spotted muskie. And most of the fish raised at uh, Wild Rose are stocked in Lake Michigan. Fish hatcheries are important to Wisconsin for many reasons. Here are just a few. Without f trout and salmon raised by fish hatcheries, there would be no future fishing, and alewives would control the Great Lakes. Also, um, fish hatcheries bring, bring jobs to, to Wisconsin and help and help the economy grow. Also. Also, tour fishing brings tourism to Wisconsin and money. In conclusion, I, it would like, I learned a lot about fish hatcheries and wild rose. And are there any questions? Thank you, Thor. And I, I have to say, it's the crowd here has the luxury of just listening to these when you're a judge, and Mr. Shutter will appreciate this. Just imagine having to pick a finalist or two out of a class of 20 to 25 similarly good presentations. It's I love going to those, but it's it's, it's hard. It's not an easy task. It's not an easy it? job. No, it isn't. So. That's why we appreciate people that will judge for us. 
Um, I'm sorry to take up, no, I'm not sorry. I, I'm happy to take up your time for this next thing because I've had the pleasure in the last couple of years to kind of expand my horizons and I work no longer just with elementary students, but I'm able to work now with middle and high school students as well. And a couple of years ago, I was asked uh, along with Heidi Me, who retired right after this, to take over the forensics uh, club and I knew nothing about forensics, so I had to learn from scratch. And it has been a real rewarding experience for the past couple of years. We had one student two years ago that walked across the stage when they made the announcement for forensics that took part. That was Laura Berry. I think she came last month and presented a very moving piece about uh, her sister and her special needs, which is a very, very touching piece. I'm glad you got to hear it. Well, tonight... Um, I have two other students that are here to share their work with us, and we went to state this year, and I'm glad to say that we have 10 students now that are participating, and I have one of my freshman students who's going to come up right now and share his presentation, who is determined to recruit every eighth grader to take part in forensics next year. If he has to go to every classroom, he says he's going to do this. So. I would like to uh, introduce to you the son of your president of the school board. This is Tynan McNallum. That's not why he's here tonight. He's here because uh, we've invited him to come here. And Tynan chose a category which is called oratory. And do you mind just explaining what it is before you share your speech? Yeah. Oratory is a persuasive speech where you pick an issue and you take a side on it and you explain your point, why it's important, and what we can do to fix or improve the situation. Okay, and now if you'd like to share your presentation with them just as you did at State during the judging. Okay. I'm going to make one other remark, okay, Mr. Yeah, Shutter. Okay. If you were here for Laura Berry's, uh, it was just a beautiful, moving speech. It was a category called Farrago. Um, which I wasn't familiar with, but if, if you had sort of a sports metaphor, it, it was like ballet. It was beautiful, it was fluid. This is oratory, and to continue the, the metaphors, this is more like boxing. So you sort of walk away feeling like you've been punched in the face. It's a much different category. Um, just, um, I guess I didn't have to point that out, but it's, it's a quite a contrast. You'll see, it's quite a contrast to the last presentation we got. Why'd you have to warn them? <laughs> it's all right. All right, and with that, we will proceed. The world's greatest extinction did not happen millions of years ago. It's happening right now. Many scientists around the world are coming to the conclusion that human activities and behaviors are contributing to an extinction of species. The extinction rate is soaring, and there may be only one thing we can do to stop it. To save species from the Amazon to the Arctic, humanity needs to take an active stance in preserving Earth's wildlife. Today, it is my goal to first enlighten you on what biodiversity is and why it's important. Secondly, explain how the behaviors and activities of humanity are destroying it, and finally, make a case for why and how we need to save it. Now, how can I make the claim that Earth is currently going through a mass extinction? Well, according to the IUCN, or the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the amount of species that we lost today was 10,000 times higher than any other period in Earth's history, except scientifically accepted mass extinctions. When a large percentage of species go extinct, ecosystems and biomes lose biodiversity. Stanford University defines biodiversity as the variety of all forms of life, from ecosystems to genetics. According to the Environmental Committee of America, biodiversity can be divided into two main parts, ecosystem diversity and genetic diversity. Ecosystem diversity is described by the IUCN as the variety of species in, and their habitats. Genetic diversity, in the words of the GDC, or Genetic Diversity Committee, is a selection of traits to help fight off disease and parasites. The IUCN believes that ecosystem diversity is important because it what, what helps regulate soil retention 
protection against invasive species, resistance against pollution, and plant pollination. The GDC explains genetic diversity is having an ability of traits to help evolve, fight off disease, and keep the species stronger as a whole. Biodiversity as a whole is important because it is what helps individual ecosystems fight off extinction. Next, let me explain how the behaviors and the activities of humanity are destroying biodiversity. We lose an acre of forest every second. Humanity takes 40% of life that the Earth generates, and the United States of America alone uses 30% of the world's non-renewable resources. These numbers from scientific analyst Carl Safina show just how much havoc we are actually wreaking. In the face of this horrible loss of life, we can point the finger at governments, farmers, miners, but remember, that leaves a couple of fingers pointing back at us. We demand excesses of cheap food, water, and resources, and we don't lose sleep at night about where we get them from. Clean water is being used faster than it can be replenished. Food stocks are being consumed faster than animals and plants can repopulate. And the United States alone uses 30% of the world's non-renewable resources. Our population's gluttony is what allows us to turn a blind eye to species going extinct and habitat being destroyed. Yet many of us still think that we are playing our role in protecting the natural world. It seems like everybody's donated to the Save the Dolphins Club or the Protect the Penguins Organization or the Keep the Koala Bears Foundation. What's wrong with this? Yes, they're important animals, and yes, they play an important role in their in individual ecosystems, but it's funny that everyone wants to save the cute and the cuddly animals at the top of the food chain instead of the ugly, boring ones at the bottom. For example, why is there nobody in Washington, D.C. carrying Save the Plankton banners? All they do is act as the basic source of sustenance for all marine life along with being the largest carbon sequester on the planet. So no matter how much we try to save the fun, the friendly, the media marketable animals, if we don't do anything about these dull, boring, unmarketable animals, there won't be any of these media friendly animals to save. Fortunately, the resources we are currently using will hold out for many more decades but what happens when every bit of land is completely exhausted? Do we turn on our precious national parks, try to level mountains and cities in search of healthy land, or chop down forests to make way for amber waves of grain? Necessity for long-term survival for us and the natural world may be adopting more primitive styles of harvesting resources, ones that replenish the land after resources have been gathered. Finally, what can we, as humans, as Earth's greatest influence, do to stop this? In truth, governments around the globe have already taken an active role in preserving the natural world. Since the 2010 Nagoya Biodiversity Summit, governments around the globe have committed to protecting 17% of the world's lands and 10% of the world's oceans by 2020 along with a promising report that federal actions have kept biodiversity 20% higher than it would be if no action had been taken. From movie stars to prime ministers, powerful and influential people are speaking out against human behaviors. Star actor Harrison Ford has stepped up and is putting personal time and money into increasing awareness of the peril the natural world is in. With a message that cuts straight to the point, quote, Nature does not need people. People need nature. It's a philosophy many important people are beginning to adopt. But governments can commit resources, organizations can spend money, and Indiana Jones can try to whip up awareness. But that alone will not save the natural world. We, the individuals, you and I, are the biggest impact. And we are the ones with the most power. Now, I could spend all day up here trying to talk about carpooling or try to talk about turning off the lights more, but I really don't think that's the answer. 
the biggest impact an individual can provide is by learning. Nelson Mandela has said that, quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. With a simple computer, one can access the sum of human knowledge. As Earth's dominant species, it is our duty to use this vast ocean of data to make biodiversity-friendly behaviors not an action, but a habit. As a species, we need to stop thinking industrialization and start thinking futurization. In a speech before the Senate, Protections for Public Lands advocate Terry Tempest Williams said, quote, To be whole, to be complete, wilderness reminds us what it means to be human, what we are connected to rather than what we are separate from. It's up to us to preserve the delicate web of the natural world, which may very well bring us down with it. Even if only a fraction of the ecosystem <coughs> survives, it can return to its thriving state once again. But if humans mine every ounce of rock, governments convert every inch of land to farming and progress, or mountains and forests are leveled to accommodate these lofty goals of our civilization, we will not be able to reclaim what we have lost. And then finally, um, we do have another student who's doing a Farago presentation tonight. This is uh, Katie Ray Lalonic. She's a senior this year. She's done a remarkable job, and I know I'm going to miss her next year with forensics. And uh, this is another emo kind of emotional one, so prepare yourself. And thank you for letting us come. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Katie Lalonic. As Mr. Shutter said, um, I will be doing a Frago piece on women in the military. Just... On January 24, 2013, the Department of Defense rescinded the direct combat exclusion rule, removing gender based barriers to military service. Since the American Revolution, women have fought shoulder to shoulder with their male counterparts in official and unofficial capacities. The following selections give voice to the frustration many of these women felt in their fight to be considered a vital part of our fighting force. In her poem, Why Do You Go?, U.S. Air Force Captain Cheryl Lockhart attempts to explain a sense of duty many Americans may not understand. Day after day, they ask me, why do you go away? What makes you leave your family? I think you should stay. My child, who's standing at the door, clutching daddy's hand, pleads again with a choking voice. Mommy, please don't go. For me, I must answer them. I need for them to know. It is not for fame, riches, or glory that I go. I go for each of you, for all that have a son, for all that have a daughter, or a special loved one. I go that when they hurt or harm's bullet has settled deep, someone will be there for them to ease them as they sleep. I go to hold them as they die in some deserted place to listen to their last goodbye and still their troubled face. I go because you cannot go and hold them when in fear and soothe the troubled brow as they cry for home so dear. So when you see me pack my bags and leave for land so far away, it is not hardness of the heart or mother's conscience gone astray. It is for love of country, freedom, duty, and honor too. But most of all, I go to bring them back to you. Throughout history, many women have been compelled to serve. Yet, it was not until 1948 that women became permanent members to our armed forces. During the Vietnam War, over 7,000 women served in Southeast Asia. In the book, Vietnam Experience, Stories of a Troubled Past, Diane Carlson Evans, a registered nurse of the Army Nursing Corps, recounts her experience and the value women brought to the combat zone. When we were under attack, our standard operating procedure was to get all of the patients under the beds. We didn't have to tell the patients to get under their beds. 
they had been out on the field and run to the bed in a second. Everybody was on the floor except for patients that were attached to intravenous therapy or, or other hookups. I put mattresses on top of them. I was in a 44-bed unit at Pleiku, and every bed was occupied with a wounded soldier. I also had wounded and burned monoguard children in my unit. So I'm running all over the place, making sure that mattresses are not only on the GIs, but the children as well. We had this one little girl who was burned by napalm from her neck to her ankles and was in terrible pain all the time. I couldn't do anything for her. I couldn't touch her, put anything on her, or put her under a bed. If you touched her, she would scream. So I just sat by her so she knew somebody was there. She became so terrified that she began screaming. So this little girl, this tiny little girl is screaming at the top of her lungs. There's the noise of incoming. It's crazier than heck. It's noisy, it's dark, and it's like a hallucination. It was awful to hear this little girl cry because this reminded the guys of home. It was bizarre. We are an American hospital for wounded GIs and none of us knew we were going to be caring for children. That is one thing I was not prepared for when I got to Vietnam. There has been a lot of controversy about whether or not women should go to war. Some believe that women should not be in combat because all the men will be taking care of the women and going to their rescue and providing aid, comfort, safety, and security for the women. Picture that scene I just shared. I was the only woman on the ward that night, and I was the only woman who was doing everything, providing the comfort, security, and safety of all the men on the unit and all the children, and I never ran for safety. I did not get under the bed. I didn't run to a bunker. I stood there by that little girl that was crying because I couldn't do anything for her. I wanted her to be able to see me. I was holding her hand. I wanted her to have a little comfort that she wasn't alone. So this whole philosophy about women being shrinking violets in a war zone is pathetic. It just didn't happen that way. Women are strong. They are maternal and they are caring. And they will carry their load, rise to the occasion, and do whatever it takes to be a part of the team. I saw women do incredible things in the combat zone in Vietnam. In 1990 and 1991, 40,000 service women deployed in support of operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Many held leadership positions in a wide variety of occupational specialties. In her book, Diary from the Desert, military intelligence specialist Mary E. Stave writes a letter to her father in frustration of being a female soldier. January 17, 1991. Dear Dad, I have a big break tonight. Guess what I heard? Women aren't going to war. Well, that's funny. What the hell am I? Really though, my favorite is the people who say, our boys over there. Better yet is, how will that affect our men over there? <laughs> now I know it's been a while since I've seen a real shower, but I'm pretty sure of the parts I contain. So, am I or am I not a woman? Yes. I am. Am I or am I not over here? <laughs> yes, I am. Am I or am I not packing live ammo 24 hours a day on this reactionary force? <laughs> yes, I am. Well, maybe I should just shave my head and call myself Marv. Okay, okay, Dad, I'm calming down. I know I'm not the first generation of women soldiers to feel this way and probably not the last either. I'm sorry, Dad. I guess I bent a lot of frustration on you. I have to admit, I really hate Army life today. Don't get me wrong, I love the USA, and the thought of Hussein and his terrorists harming one American head on American soil is enough reason to be here. But hey, let's get the show on the road. Do you remember after Grandpa died? I told you I wanted red, white, and blue roses like a flag on my casket? I guess if I do die over here, you won't have to worry about that. I feel I've earned my flag. Love, Mary E. 
The struggle to be considered a part of the team does not end after coming home. Many female veterans continue to struggle for support and acknowledgement. As expressed in the poem, Women Are Veterans Too, by Linda K. Dockin, United States Marine Corps. We weren't just tokens or pretty faces to decorate your offices and platoons. We weren't dumb, too plain, or too stupid to make it in the real world. We've marched your muddy roads, carried and shot your heavy guns. We've been shot at, wounded, and died, and been prisoners of war. We've been active in all services and risen to high ranks. We've tended your bleeding wounds and held you when you were dying. We've flown your mighty airplanes and navigated your giant ships. We've mailed letters for you and brought you news from home. We've stood alongside of you without flinching or running away and continue to stand by you today. We're not asking for special treatment or that you should go out of your way. We're only asking that you recognize that women are veterans too. On January 24th, 2013, President Barack Obama stated, today, Every American can be proud that our military will continue to grow even stronger with our mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters playing a greater role in protecting this country we love. To date, 152 service women have been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. It is our duty to honor their ultimate sacrifice and continue to support those who come home. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Shutter, and for everyone who came and um, showed us what's going on out in the schools. It's, Principal Hay was kind enough to uh, point out to me that when we don't have any students here putting on presentations, we have about three to five people in the audience, and tonight <laughs> they're standing room only. A coincidence? I don't know. But um, it's, it's great to have um, see some of those things that's that are going on out there. So thanks, Mr. Shutter, for arranging that. Thank you very much, and for all the work that goes into that.